Kicking off our conversation today, I want to introduce Susie Elzy Tuttle. Susie is joining us to discuss some problematic terminology that is prevalent in our field. Susie is a senior prospect analyst at the University of California, Berkeley. In this role, she offers full prospect development collaboration to the Division of Math and Physical Sciences, the Biological Sciences Division, and the Graduate School of Education. Susie also currently serves on APRA's DEI Committee and the APRA Connections Committee, covering leadership and professional development with a DEI lens. An experienced educator, librarian, writer, and podcaster, Susie has taught, written, and consulted on a wide range of topics, from books to relationships to communication. With that background, she's the perfect person to talk about words and language today. Susie? Thank you, Jana. Hi, everyone. As Jana mentioned, I'm Susie Elzy Tuttle, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm going to talk a bit about updating problematic terminology. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Weichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This, this land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. I recognize that every member of the UC Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. I also live on this land. I was born and raised on this land. Myself and my family have benefited greatly from the use and occupation of Ohlone land. I recognize it is my duty to support the disruption of settler colonialism. I'm going to start my talk by saying that um, language matters. It's, it's obvious, words have meaning. Yes, language is a social construct and we are the ones that ascribe meaning, but the fact remains that the words we use matter. The language we use shapes how we see the world around us, the work we do, each other and ourselves. We see this on a personal level, whether or not we engage in positive or negative self-talk, we see this interpersonally as well. For example, there is a very clear distinction between using the word aggressive to describe one person versus using the word assertive to describe someone else. Similarly, emotional versus passionate, like, oh, that group of people is too emotional for leadership positions versus, oh, I love how passionate our leadership is. See also arrogant versus confident. We see the importance of language clearly in movements around social justice. In fact, all social justice movements around identity from the 1960s civil rights movement to the LGBTQ plus movements of today have all involved some kind of language reform. Copywriters, marketing professionals, political speech writers all have intimate knowledge of how words can entice and attract or repulse and discourage. What does any of this have to do with prospect development? I'm going to talk about three common terms we use that can use a much needed update. First up on our terms to retire, portfolio penetration. Um, yikes. This term often garners two wildly different reactions. Some people, likely the people using the term, see no problems. It's merely a term to describe the degree to which a development officer's portfolio has been engaged. Some of us, however, react with a full body cringe, given the association of the word penetration with X-rated subjects. With that, I recommend this is not a term we should be using to refer to how we work with our beloved prospects. Some possible terms to use instead might be portfolio engagement, portfolio impact, or portfolio activity. The next term I want to talk about retiring is data hygiene. We have a photo here of some bleach and Lysol wipes and hand sanitizer. I think this one is particularly relevant as this past year and a half, there has been an increase in concern around personal hygiene, washing our hands, sanitizing our doorknobs and our phones. 
The word hygiene can evoke associations with sometimes moral terms like bad. The data is bad. The data is dirty. This shapes the way we view what we view and what we have to work with, as well as shapes how we view the teams and teammates that may have acquired that data in the first place. How often does grumbling about the import of, say, self-reported data from LinkedIn end up as grumbling about the team that acquired the data in the first place? So instead of the term data hygiene, some possible terms to use instead might be data integrity or data veracity. I was thinking about data accuracy as well, but uh, accuracy is a tricky term because accuracy can be a moving target. For example, terms used within certain communities around identity change over time. Just because the term is old or outdated doesn't mean it wasn't accurate or incorrect at the time it was put on record. Same can go for job titles. Accuracy is also slippery in the instance of incomplete data. For example, I have a bachelor's degree from one institution and a master's degree from another. If my undergrad university only has my bachelor's in their database, that's not necessarily inaccurate information. It just may be incomplete. The term accuracy has a certain weight and expectation to it that we should be mindful if we're going to use. The final term I'm going to talk about retiring is suspects. Before the conference, we sent out a survey and I want to share some of the results. The question was, what word does your organization use to refer to constituents who have been identified for contact with a fundraiser with the assumption that they have not yet been engaged by a fundraiser at all? 78.9% say prospect, and there were some votes for lead and unqualified or non-qualified. And yes, some of us use the term suspect, my org included. I would like to note that a few survey respondents also flagged the word prospect as one that is consistently used or rather inconsistently used at their organization. One person noted that their VP specifically asked them to change the word suspects to leads. When I hear the term suspects, here are the photos that pop into my head. On the left, we have the Beagle Boys from the DuckTales cartoon. In the middle, we have the Hamburglar. And on the right, I'm dating myself with this one, we have the cookie crook from the cookie crisp cereal commercials. Someone recommended I use an image of the Monopoly top hat guy. And to be fair, there is no fully ethical way for an individual to amass billions of dollars, but that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> it is endlessly weird to me that we are using the term suspects that has such a negative connotation to describe the people with whom we want to build lasting, meaningful, beneficial relationships. What do you think your potential donors would say if they heard the term being used for them? How would you feel about being called a suspect? It would be a turnoff at best, triggering at worst. So instead of the term suspects, some possible terms to use instead might be proactive identified. I've heard some orgs use the term PID, but I would like to warn you to be careful with shortening it to PID, which also stands for a common medical infection. Another term might be newly identified or just the term identified. Um, discovery prospects or discovery pools. Pre-engaged prospects is another option. You can also use potential prospects or potential donors showing that they have not yet become prospects or not yet become donors. Or finally, you could try to use interest pools or pools of interest instead of suspect pools. Language is dynamic. It evolves over time and I imagine even more quickly than in the past due to social media. Language can be specific to social groups, cultures, geographies, professions, and more. What I just talked about may be completely irrelevant in a decade or even less time than that. It's important that the language of our work grows and changes as we do. I encourage you to continue the conversation in the chat or on Twitter using PD or using hashtag PD2021. Thanks.
Oh, thank you, Susie. Uh, thank you for giving us so many important terms and potential replacements to think about, injecting your good humor along the way. I know my mind is a world with a few words I can think of that I'd like to change. Um, how about we try a quick chat storm? I know a lot of you are out there listening, and I imagine you also are thinking about one or two words that you might want to start a conversation around soon at your organization. So let's see those pop up in the chat while I introduce to you uh, our next expert. Kara Giacomini is the Chief Research and Data Officer for the Council for Advancement and Support of Education, or CASE. In this role, she leads CASE's AM Atlas Initiative, a resource and service provider for data, benchmarking, analytics, and original research to the educational advancement community worldwide. She's here to talk with us about the importance of establishing common definitions today. Before starting at CASE last August, Kara spent 20 years at the University of Washington, most recently as the Director of Advancement Analytics. Prior to her work in advancement, she served as a senior research scientist in the information technology department, studying the adoption of educational technologies and the effectiveness of IT services. She received her PhD in English and textual studies from the University of Washington in 2003. Welcome, Kara. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really delighted to be here today to talk about two things that I care deeply about, words and numbers. People often mistakenly think that these two are opposites or somehow at odds with each other, like that you can't be a numbers person and a word person. And I'm clearly both as my introduction indicates. But I think the reality is, is that words and numbers have a very close relationship. And by drawing on the power of words, we can really have our numbers tell a deeper story and have deeper meaning. And I'm here today to talk to you about how global standards, how common definitions can lead to global data and to provide shared insights that will benefit all of us as advancement professionals. So first I wanna start with a little story. Um, early in my career, I was surprised to learn of a major university, and I, I will leave it nameless, that took five years to define the word student. Now this may surprise many of you as it did me. After all, if you think about it, students are at the center of the mission of the university. They're the reason it exists to begin with. But I'll ask you, for those of you working in education, how many students do you have? Now let's take it a step deeper. Let's how confident are you that if I were to turn and ask another colleague at your institution, they would give me the same answer. So what happens when we give different answers? People question our data and the insights we draw from it. Time is often spent arguing over whose data is better. Barriers are often put up to sharing data in order to keep closer control. Or all of the above can happen. Now, the reality is that there's been enough practices in place that we often have a common outside source that we go to to look at some of the definitions of students that we report out to the world. So we're more likely to have a term like this in common because of the activity that's been around it that we might have with other terms. But I want to talk about why in our day to day use this term might be complicated for a university. And those of you who work in data, which is many of you in this audience, understand why these variations can occur. Um, there's so many factors that go into creating a definition. I just listed a few of the options here. So when you're thinking about students, are you thinking about unique individuals? Are you counting based on the number of credit hours someone has? Are you looking at full-time equivalent or each person counting for themselves? Um, what about those auditing classes or in certificate programs? When, then you can get into where are they studying? What departments? Which degrees? Do you count people across both degrees twice? Which campus? Is it in person or online? Then you can get into time frames. Are you counting today, the first day of the school year, the last day of the school year, the 10th day of classes? 
any variation in any of these variables, and there's many others I didn't include here, can lead to a different number and can generate that distrust that people have. So having that common definition used across all, all institutional programs at this university, taking that five years to establish a common definition used in all data sources, really was a significant achievement for this university and made it a pioneer in data governance for tackling this really hard work. And so I wanna turn this to advancement and, and put the same kind of lens on what we do in advancement and ask the question, how many donors do you have? Now, there are just as many variables that go into defining a donor as there are in defining a student. Are we thinking of individuals or corporations? Legal or soft credit? What about people who give to multiple departments? Where do they count and how do they count? Um, pledges or outright gifts? How confident are you that if I were to turn to one of your colleagues, they would provide the same number? And I can say I was once in a meeting where I was delighted that leadership was using data in everything they said, but every single person who spoke used a different number to talk about the number of donors. So it's really easy to have variation here. So are you confident in the number of donors you have? And if you are, it's likely because you've done some of the work to get to common definitions and shared data. So how as advancement professionals who care about data and who care about doing our work precisely, consistently, with integrity, all the things that we do in this space, can we be sure that we are talking about the same thing? So this past spring, CASE released our first global reporting standards. These standards were built on previous editions, um, the most recent from 2009, but those were created just for US institutions. So this edition was very unique in that it took that work globally and started to think what definitions matter no matter where you are on the planet. What do we need to understand as advancement professionals so that we can make meaningful comparisons and speak the same language and count things in the same way? And this was a really heavy lift. Like I said, the standards were last updated in 2009 and then only looking at the US. So to have that widening view and to make meaningful updates that tracked what happened in the last decade and just how we are as a profession was no small task. And we convened a volunteer committee with representatives from around the globe. We talked to members and this work took two and a half years. I will say slightly less than the five years I articulated earlier for defining the term student, but it also highlights the real importance and hard work it is to come up to share it with shared knowledge. And I wanna talk a little bit about what happens next. So now that we've introduced these standards, what really matters is getting everyone to use them. Because the whole point of common definitions is that we can refer to one source and count things in the same ways and know if we're doing something different, why it's different, to quantify that difference and to still have trust amongst each other in the numbers that we're providing. And so we asked in a poll before this presentation a while ago to all of you, how does your organization define fundraising terms? And I always like to highlight the good things data are telling us as well as the places that have an opportunity for growth. And here I'm delighted to say that many of you have some type of shared terminology, that you see the benefit in that, that your institutions, the vast majority of you have some level of formal glossary or at least shared knowledge, even if it's not documented. Um, what I'd love to see, though, is that more were saying that they were using the case global reporting standards. I'm going to pretend this is because we just released the new edition, and you're all going to scurry out and look at them and start to reference to the, them very closely as we move forward, especially after we talk about some of what we can gain from that. But the goal is to really have what we see as our vision at case, more and more people pointing to the same source of truth, the same definitions, so we can measure and track things in similar ways. And I'm gonna now dig a little bit into the process we went through with these standards and why these shared definitions matter. So the first thing I wanna highlight is, as I've mentioned before, the last definition, the last edition of the standards was published in 2009, quite some time ago, and tied to US tax code. So when you tie things to tax code, what counts as a gift? Well, what the IRS says counts as a gift. 
And how does that work when you suddenly look outside the US? Obviously, it doesn't work at all. And it keeps us as a profession shifting towards changes in how taxes are calculated. And instead of looking to tax code of any region to define what educational philanthropy is, our committee really looked at what do we as advancement professionals consider to be philanthropy? How is this based in the ethical principles of our profession in all that we value as practitioners in this space? And so they came up with a common definition that applies no matter what the tax code of any region says. And I'm going to highlight one really important aspect of that. And that is to count as a gift, financial support must be provided for the sole purpose of benefiting the institution's mission and its social impact without the expressed or implied expectation that the donor will receive anything more than recognition as the result of such support. And this really matters because what this is saying is that a gift can't have donor influence or quid pro quos or some of these other tangible donor benefits that are not um, making it a true act of philanthropy. And the standards really articulate a lot of what that looks like and how to handle unique situations that may arise in our profession. And if you've been re reading any news stories about philanthropy lately, you know that these issues do come up. So the standards, in addition to being a definition for philanthropy, provide guidance and support on what really, how to be ethical practitioners in this space and how to count in ethical ways. So now going back to the question I posed earlier, how many donors do you have? If you have a common set of standards to rely on, it's much easier to answer this question. And it's not only easier to answer this question in terms of here's a way to count that we all are using the same way, but in this unique circumstance, I need to do something slightly different. And now I can explain why my numbers look different without undermining the credibility of other numbers, because there's a single source to refer back to. And I'll explain that a little in some of the details of who's a donor. How many donors do you have? Now, to get to a definition of who's a donor, or how many donors, based on case standards, we look at entities, individuals, or organization so that transmit a gift or grant to an institution. And we have a lot of guidance as to what counts in this space, including not counting government support or pass through government support. Um, so this starts to get to a clear definition of who is a donor, what is a gift. And then for counting and reporting purposes, we talk about only the legal donor. So you're counting one entity per gift um, or unique donors as you roll that up. Um, but we, we highlight the fact that it's really important to think of all the people who might be, get credit for a gift when you're looking at recognition and stewardship, when you're going to a different use case. We also provide really specific guidance for if you want to be able to classify your donors into just one category at a time for counting, what hierarchy to use of various classifications someone could fall into with alumni, then parent or grandparent or trustee or board member, et cetera. What's important about this is that there's going to be uses of data where you'll want to count every single affiliation someone has. But this provides a way of giving that prioritization when you need to, when you need to not have the duplication. And you know in advance that there's times when we need both ways of looking at things. So this provides a clear way to count and then a way of understanding in different use cases why you might see something different. And now another piece that's really exciting in the new standards is that we have two different ways of capturing your fundraising activity. We have first funds received. And for a US audience, this will seem very familiar. This is a measure of money in the bank, um, cash in the door, anything that actually came into your account within the reporting year. Um, and this is really commonly used in our US surveys. But there's another lens we put on fundraising with the new standards, and that is new funds committed. 
And this is a measure of overall fundraising activity within a reporting period. So it's counting those outright gifts as well as pledges of up to five years, um, bequests from those over age 65. And there's a variety of other nuances that go into this. But what it captures is the activity that you were engaged in, the promises that came in, how effective your fundraising efforts were within this period of time. And this has been really commonly used in the UK. So taken together, these two ways of measuring provide a very complete look at what's happening with fundraising and the direction that we'll be going at CASE as we're starting to track things going forward, really paving the way for global benchmarks where we can make comparisons no matter where you are while, with, while upholding some of the common practices we see regionally. So where this really gets us at case that I talked about how words become numbers, that's really most of what my job is, is really thinking of how we take global standards, common definitions that help us see things and count things in the same way, develop global metrics where we can really start to see trends no matter where we are, and have global data that's providing actionable insights that unite us as a profession. And the more that we adhere to the same standards, and we count things in the same way, the deeper the insights are that we can glean from the data that we collect. And we can know with confidence that we're talking to each other, we're speaking the same language. And there's a lot more resources on the CASE website. Um, so I encourage you to check that out or to reach out to me directly. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Kara, thank you. These global standards are something our industry has long been in need of. Uh, when we envisioned this part of the session early on, Carrie and I discussed how frequently leadership turns to benchmarking results to make decisions. You know, benchmarking that tries to show how we're the same or different or how we stand out compared to our peers. But often that raises so many questions about how the data we receive matches our definitions or our business processes. Um, so I'm really eager to see how this new global standard improves our industry's benchmarking and communications going forward. There is no doubt in my mind that having shared language will empower us all to become better advocates and strategists at our organizations. So thank you. Um, and that leads me to our final presenter today. Uh, Paul Wiklanski is uh, the Senior Associate Director of Prospect Development at the University of Michigan. He's been a thought leader and a problem solver focused on change management, analytics, and creativity. Um, Paul is on APRA's advocacy committee and is the former president of APRA Michigan. Before shifting into the prospect development world, Paul worked in the corporate sector and on the University of Michigan's marketing and annual giving teams. And these marketing skills, advocacy work, and creativity make Paul the perfect presenter to share how our language choices can move us forward and help us position and brand ourselves as experts. Paul? Great, thank you. Here we go. So today, what we're gonna talk about are three words that we often hear in our industry. Two that I think that are very empowering and one that's demeaning without really meaning to be. It's notable that in our APRA talk survey, no one claims to use this final word, though we do know that it's happening. And we're going to talk about how these words matter and how I'd like for our conversations, how I'd like to have our conversations um, be more representative of who we are. So let's first start by talking about advocacy. Advocacy in the sense that I want to help us ensure that we are seen in the best possible light, that we're seen for the skills that we have, the insight we provide, and the impact that we create. We have to be our own advocates. I believe it's important to remember that advocacy does start with ourselves. We have the ability to show those around us how we want to be seen as well as heard we have the power and the ability to shape perception. Perception is a funny thing. We can all look at the same situation, data, or even an image and see it differently. Each of us defines our own truth. So it's important that when we guide the perception that others have of us, 
perception is also about focus, about understanding that we all see the world around us through a lens, yet we can help to work to shape that focus and manage that perception. When we think of ourselves, we do see ourselves one way, and yet how we see ourselves can be quite different than from how others see us, how they perceive us. So our job is to advocate for ourselves, to focus those perceptions so that they are one and the same. All of this is to say that words matter. It's not just about understanding how we're seen, but also the words that we use to describe what we see, the words that we choose to represent ourselves. We're all well served to remember that words and labels have meaning and that we are in control of our own self image or our brand. So let's talk about that last word for a second. Our brand and the word that no one claims in the APRA talk survey to use to refer to themselves, although we know it happens. So I'm going to begin by asking you two simple questions. Think about how you would describe your workplace to a stranger. Which of these would you choose to describe your work environment? And please keep in mind that the definitions shown here are from Merriam-Webster. Now think about how you would choose to be perceived as an individual. And I wanna be fair, this is not a value judgment. We should all have respect for each of these groups. So then why? Why do we call our workplaces shops? Google it. Do these, do these images represent how we want people to think of us, of the work that we do? Often I hear people refer to themselves as working in research, prospect management, or advancement shops. And I wonder, do they say this wanting to be viewed in this way as transactional support staff? Alternatively, wouldn't they rather be viewed for what they really are? professionals, consultants. I often challenge these people and I ask them if the major gift officers or the consultants that they work with self-identify as working in shops. Overwhelmingly, the answer is no. So then why do they do it? The words we choose, the words we use to describe ourselves should really reflect the work that we do. It's up to us to match our work, our skills, knowledge and impact to the perceptions we have of ourselves, and maybe even more importantly, with the perceptions that other ha others have of us. So who are we? What do we do? This is who we are. We are consultants. We create information. We develop insights that guide success. People turn to us for ideas, guidance, and knowledge. They turn to us as professionals. Let's remember, we don't just want a seat at the table, we want the seat at the head of the table. So why does this matter? It's because we want, it matters because we want to empower one another. We know that we can make this change because we've already done it in some cases. We're already seeing this happening. Many of us have done this, and if you haven't, here are some ways to start. Here's some examples of the ever-changing choices of words. For example, portfolio reviews have become portfolio consultations, defining a shared sense of strategic emphasis. We've gone from being limited to creating research guides and briefings to leading strategy sessions. Metrics are no longer viewed as a yardstick. Instead, they're viewed as coaching opportunities, showing how we've become partners and coaches. And yes, we heard you at the, in the Apertalk survey. 90% of respondents say they use or prefer the use of the word team. This is because we realize that we are not clerks, cashiers, or salespeople. We are not machinists, woodworkers, or repair people. We don't work in stores, at kiosks, or industrial settings. No. We are consultants. We're members of teams. We're members of departments. This is my personal call to action. 
use this as an opportunity to think about the words that you use and the power that they have. Think about the importance of empowering yourself as well as others. I want you to work to promote your achievements as well as your potential. Together, we can advocate for ourselves, our teammates, and our profession. Let us use words that promote the genuine impact that we have. While I appreciate there may be a legacy, a history, of referring to our teams as shops, I for one will not, and I'm asking that you don't either. I have the utmost respect for employees of the countless retail stores and shops, for the many who work in machine shops, repair shops, etc. But when I think of what we do, when I think of who we are, I see us for who we are, advancement professionals, experts, consultants, whose advice, skills, and insights contribute not only to our organizational fundraising successes, but also to our donors' ability to realize their philanthropic goals and dreams. I'm a firm believer in advocating for my team, my organization, and our profession. I'm your advocate, but in order for you to be seen for your fullest potential, we all need to see ourselves for the fundraising professionals that we are. So I'll ask you again, do you see yourself as a shopkeeper or as a consultant? How you see yourself does affect how you and others see the services and the advice that you provide. I want you to see yourself as part of the overall fundraising strategy of your organization. I want to empower you. I want to advocate for you. I want you to stop the shop. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Way to add on a whole nother level of thinking about communication in our words here, Paul. Thank you. Uh, it feels really inspiring for me to be thinking about the impacts of word changes many of us have tackled or might want to make to help others see the value we're adding in the industry. If Paul's comments have you thinking of a change you want to make in the name of advocating for your team, your organization, or our profession, let's fill the chat one more time with the promises you're making yourself to revisit when the, store, when the conference is over. I mean, we all know at this point that if we write it down, it's more likely to become a reality. So let's hear it. What words are you thinking could use a change after hearing from all of our presenters today? You're on mute. Thanks, Carrie. <laughs> Apparently my words, you know, are not getting conveyed the way that I meant for them. <laughs> um, so while y'all are chiming in on the chat, I just want to, uh, you know, come back to our presenters today. Susie, thank you. Thank you for talking about how our words can be problematic or portray the wrong image. We've seen that happen in the news, in politics and across society over the past year. Um, and we know that words get outdated and meanings shift over time. There are some words in our industry that we need to change. So thank you for highlighting those and proposing alternatives today. Um, and then Kara, Kara, thank you for joining us to discuss shared meaning and how this common understanding of language makes such a large impact on inclusion and success. We're so fortunate to have a member of the prospect development community in a position like yours, where you can identify and implement these important discussions on a global level. How we define these fundraising terms really ensures that our messaging and our data is clear and consistent. And we're so grateful that you could speak to the case global reporting standards with the APRA community today. Um, and Paul, thank you for your advocacy. The topics you brought up today have already been implemented in Michigan, and we see that advocacy play out in your department and how you've always talked about your work. Um, so today we were thrilled that you were willing to share those ideas and insights with our colleagues around the world. And I hope folks can take your good ideas back to their, I'm not going to say it, their organizations or their departments uh, to implement similar changes and to ensure that prospect development makes it to that seat at the table. So thank you. The three of you really have shown us that our words can be negative, uh, 
Our words can be positive. They can be straightforward, misinterpreted, but above all, they're really important. We need to be mindful of what we're saying, how it's being heard by our colleagues, our donors, and our leadership. Jana and I hope that everyone out there heard a few things today that sparked a new idea. Maybe you have some words you want to retire at your organization. What fall? I didn't say it either. And hopefully you've gained a vision for how to advocate for or to promote your team or your work. Jana and I are thrilled that you were all able to join us today on these screens together in our virtual world. And we really hope you enjoy the rest of APRA PD 2021. Please don't forget to take a moment to fill out the session evaluation. And thank you for being here with us.